Good morning. Welcome to our webinar. Today is Tuesday, December 12th, and we are very, very, very happy to, you know, to see you. So you joining us. Uh, we're going to wait for a few minutes for any participants who might be running a bit behind. We're hoping everyone is doing well. The weather here in upstate New York seems to be somewhat mild. We did get to enjoy 63 degrees over the weekend, and that's unusual for a part of the state. Of course, yesterday it was freezing, and today it's going to be 46 again. You know, I'm sure everyone is uh, going through the same thing, but the sun is shining, so we are very, very happy. So I'm going, I think we're going to start at 11.02, maybe. So another minute or so. Um, trying to think what else. I mean, we have about nine people. So we'll have, oh, I see 11.02. I say we're going to start. Good morning, officially. My name is Jana Lender, and we have Sam Vickers. Hello, everyone. Um, 2023 is our eighth filing season. So you can say between the two of us, we have seen it all. Today, we'll chat about what is new from a new filing standpoint, as well as talk about affordability in detail, since most of your organizations are in their open enrollment period. We'll also discuss state filing and whether your organization might need help in 2023 or 2024. As always, we will sprinkle our webinar with some good questions to, to keep it exciting and to see if we're missing any topics our clients or non-clients need more information about. We also encourage your questions to be asked in the chat, or you can always contact your account manager for additional details. As we mentioned in the previous slide, those of you who are in the open enrollment have their plan costs for 2024 already set. Therefore, the affordability discussion might be only one-sided in terms of what it pertains to. It's only going to pertain to affordability penalty prevention. For those who have July to June enrollment cycle, you still have time to have your 2024 plan costs to be in line with the affordability threshold. Sam, what is the 2024 affordability percentage and why do we choose rate of pay as our method to determine if plan is subject to affordability penalty? It's a great question, Yana. So every year the IRS sets a specific cost ceiling for individual coverage. From a premium tax credit perspective, this ties into an employee's household income. For 2024, the IRS has set this amount to 8.39%. This means that if an individual coverage plan exceeds 8.39% of household income, the plan is then deemed unaffordable. However, in order to trigger an ESRP payment, or in the ACA world, the B penalty, an individual must be ACA full-time ergo working 30 hours per week or more, they have to enroll in exchange coverage and qualify for a premium tax credit. If an employer has multiple plan options for employees, we always use the lowest costing single plan to determine affordability, regardless of the actual plan selected by the employee. Since employers do not know an individual employee's household income, the IRS gives us three methods or safe harbors for calculating affordability. First of these is rate of pay, which is our premier method. Next, W-2 wages. And finally, federal poverty. The rate of pay is often the best method to use for employers when determining affordability for their plans. This method can be used for both hourly and salary employees and has a much higher cost ceiling than using federal poverty and even most oftentimes using the W-2 method. The W-2 method only really works better if an individual has quite a few overtime hours for most of the year. 
In the next few slides, we're going to walk you through a few example calculations on rate of pay for both an hourly and salaried employee. So as of 2024, it is said that the minimum wage is scheduled to increase on January 1st, 2024 to $15 per hour for New York State with the exception of New York City, Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester counties where the minimum wage would go up to $16. With that said, let's show how an organization can determine whether the affordable plan offered is affordable for their hourly employees. So let's say you have an employee who makes $15.50 per hour. And you have decided that the lowest single plan offered to your employees will cost $178.95 per month in the calendar year 2024. With the 8.39% set as the affordability threshold, your employee will not be able to afford such plan. You can see on the screen the formula established by the IRS and the values pertaining to the organization. So when you look at it, you would say, okay, so the employee can only afford $169 per month. So what? Um, if employee waives this plan and turns to the exchange to request the subsidized coverage, the IRS will come and ask you for subsidy back in the form of a 226J letter. What can you do then? We can help you decide your plan cost in advance. The percentage is generally released in August of the current reporting year. Or if the plan cost is already set, we can utilize W2 method to determine affordability. We would need the box one amount for the employee's W2. Or you can choose potentially pay the affordability penalty, which is said to be $4,460 in the reporting year 2024. Before we dive into the salaried employee, I just wanna let everyone know we have an active poll question on the board. Has your organization established their 2024 health plan rates as of yet? Awesome. And as always, if you have any questions in the chat, please feel free at any time. So let's dive into an example using a salaried employee. So as you can see, Lucy, our example employee, is making just under $27,000 per year. The formula used works almost the same way as it would for an hourly employee. If we take someone's annual salary, assuming they work for the organization for all 12 months, we divide that by 12, multiply it by affordability percentage to get our cost ceiling for the most affordable single plan. So in Lucy's case, the maximum plan cost for single coverage would be $185.96. Here are some steps you can take to minimize an organization's risk for the potential affordability penalties if Peter or Lucy were to waive company coverage. First, review out all hourly pay rates and salaries and make sure your compliance provider, and Paragon Compliance, please review with your account manager, have an accurate representation of your workforce. Make sure that you have a waiver on file where it indicates alternative coverage. The reason for this is to make sure if you've got employees that get coverage through a spouse, there will be no risk for affordability penalties in those cases. But if an individual does go to the exchange for coverage, you'd have advance notice on those. If Peter indicates that he has chosen to enroll in subsidized coverage, always alert your compliance provider. And as always, if you're a client of Paragon Compliance, please contact your account manager right away. As mentioned in the previous slide, we can always use the W-2 box one amount when filling, filing a 1095C form for 2023. If Peter does work a lot more hours, including overtime hours, this can be more beneficial than using the standard rate of pay method. And we have a question in the chat. So have you ever helped a company respond to an IRS notice for affordability? The answer is yes. While the IRS is a bit delayed, we've seen currently just for 2020 filings, um, we have seen 226J notices go out for affordability related items. Um, we have responded to these letters as well, and we have generally a pretty good success rate. 
Um, some of the things we look at is determining was the affordability actually correct in terms of the calculations. We look at an employee's hourly or salary rates. Look at those, those items. I'm so sorry, we have a little interruption. It happens sometimes. Uh, so we're gonna continue our um, presentation on the next slide. And um, we are actually going to view how does the plan cost and affordability affect 1095C form. If Peter has a potential of having an, affor an affordable offer of coverage for the reporting year of 2024, he most likely had an afford unaffordable offer of coverage for the reporting year 2023. The percentage from the IRS for the year 2023 is 9.12%. So let's say the high deductible health plan uh, for a single employee uh, was at $176.12 for the filing year 2023. And Peter is making $14.75 per hour. He's waiving offered coverage all year in 2023. You can see in red the calculation. So you take the hourly rate, you apply 130 hours, which is the uh, minimum of, uh, established by the IRS, and then you uh, multiply it by 9.12%. We come to $174.88. It is actually below the number that the company established for their lowest single plan, which was $176. So here's what we will see on the 1095C form. You can look that a 1E in line 15 would indicate that the employee um, was offered coverage. The line on um, 15 will show the amount um, of the single lowest plan, which is $176.12. And you can see that the line um, 16 is actually blank. Typically, if Peter's um, plan was affordable, we would see 2H because he's waiving it. Since the coverage is not affordable, the field is left blank. So what happens? The IRS actually um, tabulates all the forms with the blank line 16 and compares it to all individuals who asked for the, for the subsidized coverage. Those who match up would be a potential for the affordability penalty. So this is why we urge all of our clients and non-clients to review your 2023 affordability reports and connect with us as soon as possible if you think you have any employees who are opting out to enroll through the exchange. Um, we actually got to the next um, slide, and we just wanted to kind of check in to see if we have any um, questions, any additional questions in the chat. Sam, do you see any questions? Um, no, no questions. No questions yet. so far. Okay, but we, I believe we're going to get our second polling question, and we're going to continue. All right, so let's talk about filing deadlines for 2023 filings. So as you may or may not know, during the 2022 filing season, the IRS had made a final decision to permanently extend the distribution deadline of 1095C forms from January 31st to March 2nd. This means that your form should be postmarked or distributed electronically to your employees by March 2nd of 2024 for the current filing year of 2023. A lot of you have seen, and some have reached out to us, an email from a payroll provider urging you about the deadlines, and they have cited the original January 31st deadline. In our opinion, this is a sales tactic that reveals the shortcomings of payroll companies when they attempt to be an ACA expert. We urge you to reach out to your trusted ACA provider 
there is ever any confusion about any looming deadlines. Another news for the filing season 2023 is the fact that the employers with under 250 forms are no longer able to submit forms manually. We have always transmitted forms electronically on behalf of our clients, and therefore there is no change in the process there. However, for our non-client participants today, please make sure that if you have done it via mail in the past, check if you can transmit to the IRS electronically, and if not, please reach out to us so we can help. In regards to the state filing news, like in the year prior, states that are requiring employees to file 1095C on behalf of employees who reside in the following states, California, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and District of Columbia. We are actually looking into 1099 HC filing for the state of Massachusetts. That filing has been required for a long time. We just didn't go into that space, so to speak. However, please reach out um, to your respective account manager if you have any questions. If you are non-client, we will mention our contact information at the end of the presentation. So let's talk about uh, general state filing requirements. So in general, states have required that insurance companies fill out an employer's behalf uh, to fulfill the filing requirement. This is generally done through the 1095B form, um, which is distributed by these insurance companies. However, we at Paragon have found several occurrences in the past where insurance companies and insurance providers took a stand in not participating in fulfilling these state requirements. If that happens, employers are still responsible for ensuring the filing is completed. When we look at the specific state requirements, ultimately the responsibility falls to the employer to make sure that these items are filed on time. For self-insured employers, you are required to file the federal 1095C forms normally um, to fulfill these state requirements. In both cases, if your organization has employees living in the states, such as Washington, D.C., California, Rhode Island, and New Jersey, Paragon or your compliance provider for non-client participants generally helps or can help with your state filing needs. Typically, states do not release official deadlines for the filing year until a month or a few weeks before the federal deadline approaches. As you can see, state of California has January 31st as their distribution date. Last year, California added to their state filing guidelines a blurb. It still actually appears on their website that reads that there will be no penalty associated with late distribution or late filing. Because California actually accepts 1095C forms for their state filing portion, we would follow the federal deadlines for distribution and transmission. District of Columbia follows federal distribution deadline and accepts 1095C forms. Therefore, forms should be distributed by March 2nd, 2024. If you have any employees living in District of Columbia who are enrolled in coverage, we will transmit those individuals to the District of Columbia by April 30th. States of New Jersey and Rhode Island are following federal deadlines, and therefore we would do the same. And I believe we have reached another questions point. We're going to check on you again to see if there are any questions so far. And we are also going to see another polling question. Do we see any questions? No questions, but this is a big poll question. So do you need help with your state filings? Yes. So if you don't know what that means, or if you feel you need help, or you, if you would like um, to have more information, definitely reach out um, to your account managers. That's for our Paragon clients. And if you are our non-client, if you are just learning about us, um, reach out and we will be happy to help. And maybe to help on um, 
some of the I don't know answers to the polling question, we'll talk a little bit about New Jersey specifics. Um, and this typically follows generally what all states are requiring for these ACA filings. So for New Jersey, they require each primary enrollee who is a New Jersey resident and to whom the filer provided minimum essential coverage to in all or part of 2023. So the state of New Jersey determines a part year resident is a primary enrollee who is domiciled in New Jersey for at least 15 days in any month. Requirements also state that New Jersey receives an appropriate NJ 1095, 1095B, or 1095C forms. The state currently expects to accept NJ 1095 forms, fully completed federal 1095A, B, and C forms and or 1095C forms with parts one and three completed. Um, and just as your reference, when we look at the 1095C, part one is going to be your general employee information and part three is going to be those covered individuals, um, also known as dependents that are also covered under that in individual employee. And this is um, something very important that New Jersey has. If an insurer will not meet its obligation, an employer is required to send the files itself a fully completed federal 1095B or NJ 1095 meets New Jersey requirements. I believe we have a question in the um, chat. Is New York State planning on requiring ACA filing? Um, we hope so. We haven't seen anything um, as of yet. And a little bit later in the presentation, we actually will touch on some of the states that we have heard the chirpings about potential state filing, but nothing from New York State. It would be a big one, though, because uh, I mean, we are a large state, so we're looking forward to the challenge. And typically, New York State loves to follow California, so definitely on the horizon and something to look out for. So let's um, kind of chat about uh, fully insured employers. Um, Definitely check with your coverage provider to confirm if they're filing for the required states on your behalf. Again, again how we found out um, a few years ago, we um, sent a notification to our clients and we said, okay, these states are on board for the state filing. Uh, you're fully insured. Make sure you check with your coverage provider. And guess what? certain local coverage providers didn't feel like they need to do the job. So we came to the rescue. So if you followed up with your coverage provider and they said, yes, fantastic. Make sure you request a confirmation email or a receipt for each state that they did the filings for. Because um, it is important if states decide to um, actually come back and do some auditing you need that proof of filing. If they say no, and as we mentioned before, not every coverage provider is created equal, please let Paragon Compliance know and we can help assist with the state filing requirements. Um, there may be additional information that we would need for dependents if we are going to help with that. So for our self-insured employers out there, um, unfortunately, all state filings kind of rest solely on your shoulders. So for any employer offering self-insured plan, as I said, this burden is on your shoulders. For your 1095C filings, you'll want to make sure you have accurate information completed on all parts of the 1095C, including parts one and three, and also include any dependent information and COBRA offerings. Any individual with addresses in the various states that require these state filings should be filed appropriately. And for our Paragon compliance clients out there, this is something we do for you automatically. Once we finish your federal filings and those are corrected for any name and you know, TIN mismatches, we will then file those with each appropriate state. And I actually have a pretty unique example for one employer that uh, was self-insured um, located in New York State. So typically all of their employees had resided here. However, we had one case where an employee had terminated, opted into COBRA coverage, and then moved to the state of New Jersey. So in that case, they exceeded their 15-day uh, domicile limit. So in that case, even though they were no longer employed, 
they still had that COBRA coverage. And since they were resident of the state of New Jersey, they were required to file state filings for that COBRA coverage. So if you've got retirees that maybe have retiree coverage and move out of state, that could potentially open you up to state filings. Um, so always something to be aware of. So let's talk about a little bit of the actual filing process. Um, as we mentioned, each state has their own unique filing process, filing portal, and steps. Yet none of the states have created a way to correct forms that might have been sent over with errors. Um, Sam just mentioned that, um, and I'm sure all of you are aware that um, when we file, we get back a um, wrong name or mismatch name, a wrong SSN, et cetera. So what we do is we typically transmit federal forms first, and we prefer to receive accepted or accepted with error status. If individuals residing in the states with additional filing requirements have their forms marked as accepted with errors, we like to make corrections on the federal level first. This is, again, because there is no correction mechanism present. Um, and we like to send to the states um, the best 1095C forms that we can. Once 1095C forms have been submitted and confirmations received, Paragon will notify you and provide submissions details for each record. You will also get the report of the records transmitted to each state, as well as their receipt IDs and confirmation messages, depending on each state's output. So let's talk about maybe potential penalties for state filings. So failure to file has penalties all across the board for each individual state, and they are as follows. California has set a $50 per individual form not filed. And while the other states have no specific dollar amounts attached to those failure to file penalties, um, they are present in each of their uh, filing requirements. So therefore, it is very important that we are vigilant on behalf of our clients for both federal and state filings for each and every filing year. Yeah, those uh, penalties can be sneaky. And if you are budget conscious, you definitely would like to avoid because one form is $50, 100 forms is $5,000. So you do not want to do that. So this goes back to that question about the New York State filing. Um, as of today, you've heard there are only a handful of states that require. Um, if you looked at the map, those that are marked in the red, and that is Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, Minnesota, Vermont, and Washington, um, they all have mentioned at some point that they're looking to establish state filing requirements. They just haven't come around it. So we are literally combing every state's website at least once a month to see if any of them came out with the requirements. As soon as we hear something, we will make sure to notify you. And if you ever have a question or let's say uh, you've added um, a subsidiary in one of the states, reach out, let us know, and we will be happy to um, check on your behalf if there is um, something that's required. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We hope this information was useful to you. And as we mentioned in the beginning, if you are a client and would like to chat about affordability for the 2023 filing year, or looking ahead to your 2024 plans, please reach out to your account managers directly. If you're not our client, we'd like to see if we can help with you, please contact us through our website on the screen or call us at 585-348-5020. Please note that a recording of our webinar will be posted to our website and anyone who has registered for this webinar will receive an email with a link to that webinar's recording. Once again, thank you very much for attending and have a wonderful day.